So now that we've finished the overview for the course, it's time to start diving in to the actual contents. Now this course focuses primarily on functional parallel programming. However, to have a basis to understand this, it's really useful to also have a good grasp of sequential programming. So we're going to have a couple of lessons up front that give an overview of sequential programming concepts as well as their pros and cons. And we'll start out by giving an understanding of the meaning of sequential programming, which at a high level is basically a way of programming where each step in a program is executed in order one at a time. And this is probably something you've done for many, many years in other classes. Mastering these concepts is essential before trying to learn more advanced concurrent and parallel programming concepts, which of course will be the focus of this class. So what is a sequential program? A sequential program is a form of computing that executes the same sequence of instructions and always produces the same results. That's another way of saying that the execution is deterministic. What does it mean to be deterministic, you may ask? Well, it means that given a certain input, the same output will always be produced in the same order. So uh, you'll see I have a, a love of analogies and visualizations and so on. So a good analogy for this would be a drive through line at a fast food restaurant where the cars line up, they go through one at a time, someone places an order, typically through some kind of automated uh, microphone type of ordering station, and then they drive forward after the order has been placed, and then they'll go ahead and either pay at a window or maybe uh, pay at one window, pick up at a different window, or pay at a window, pick up at the window, but it's all very sequential, and given the input of cars, the output will always be the same. So it's very linear, very deterministic. Of course, this deterministic behavior is premised on the fact that there's no deliberate use of randomness. You can use random numbers and random algorithms for various things, but we're assuming for the sake of this discussion that that's not what's happening. So the code is taking steps that are not random. Interestingly enough, it turns out that we will talk about the use of randomization in the context of the Java fork join framework, which uses a very interesting technique known as work stealing. And it uses randomness in order to be able to reduce the contention from which queue in a pool of threads and queues the work will be stolen from. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm just giving you a pre preview of coming attractions, if you will. So going back to sequential programs that are not random, they have two main characteristics. First, the textual order of their statements in the code specifies their order of execution. So what does that mean? Well, let's take a look at an example that comes from the Java ArrayList class. There's a get method that's going to return the index element in the ArrayList. And you can see that it's follow, it has a method called range check that checks to make sure the index is in range. And then it has a call to a method called element data that returns the value at that index. Needless to say, chaos and insanity will occur in Java's ArrayList get implementation if the range check method is not called before element data. If for some reason some compiler reordered these, inst these instructions or these calls so that element data went before range check, bad, bad things would happen. Another characteristic of a sequential program is that successive statements must execute without any temporal overlap that's visible to programs. Now, what that really means is there could be all kinds of clever optimizations under the hood, but the effect should be as if the statements executed success successfully or successively and sequentially and without any temporal overlap. So what, what does that mean? Let's take a look at an example. Here we have an example where we say A equals B plus C and D equals E minus A. And implicit in the semantics of this, say in Java, is the value of A must be assigned before the value of D is assigned. And that seems sort of obvious, but there's more to the story than may meet the eye at first glance. In particular, it turns out that lower layers in the solution stack, in the different layers from the hardware up through the OS kernel and the system libraries and the Java execution environment and so on up to the application code, they can actually reorder instructions as long as they do it in a way that preserves the semantics. So in this particular case, preserving semantics means that A is going to be given a value before we use A in computing the value of D. So what does this all mean in practice? Well, let's take a look at an example that would be common in a modern pipeline 
pipeline hardware environment where it's possible to do out of order execution of instructions in order to avoid so-called pipeline stalls that would otherwise delay instruction execution. So let's assume for sake of argument that the A, B, C, D, and E variables are in memory as opposed to located somewhere that's a farther away in the storage hierarchy and that loads and stores take one clock cycle and then uh, as a consequence, we want to make sure that we can optimize the performance of this, the solution so that it avoids pipeline stalls. So let's take a look at an example to make this more clear. So here's the original code that might be generated by a compiler that does not eliminate the pipeline stalls. So we're gonna load the value of B from memory into a register. We're gonna load the value of C into a register, but because there's one instruction cycle required to do this, there would otherwise be a pipeline stall at this point so that we can use the value of C to add the value of register B to the value of register C and store that into register A. So the next two instructions are adding B and C into register A and then storing register A into the memory location A. The next step is to load the value of E from memory into register E. That again takes an instruction cycle. So there's a stall here if we do it this way in which case we would then go ahead and subtract A from E, store it into register D, and then store register D's contents into memory location D. So that's the way it would be done if you didn't do out of order execution. Here is the way that could be optimized, either at the assembly code level or even at runtime with the hardware, to be able to schedule the code to avoid those pipeline stalls. Pipeline stalls are bad because they end up costing you computation that could have been done, but instead just did nothing. It was a no op. So all we do here is we go ahead and hoist the load of E into register R E into the stall slot. And therefore, by the time we need to get access to C and the time we need to get access to uh, E, they're already loaded and we don't have to wait. The code doesn't have to have any no op stalls in place. Now, here's the good news. All of these kind of optimizations are mercifully done under the hood and so you don't really have to know or care how this is done in practice. You just have to be aware that sequential programming has certain guarantees semantically and within the confines of those guarantees, the underlying assembler and compiler and hardware, in fact, can rearrange the instruction order. By the way, this is an interesting picture under the hood of a car that's a driverless car. And uh, so as a consequence, it has a very complicated software in it. So it, it kind of looks like a server room more than the underside of uh, the engine compartment in a car. So that's the end of the, our overview of sequential programming concepts. We're now going to talk about pros and cons and then get into the more of the focus of the course, which is on concurrent and parallel programming.